God, will you build us up as your people? We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible this morning, I want to go ahead and invite you to turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5 this morning. As you're turning there, I want to ask the question, have you ever considered your role? Your role in your family? Your role in the workplace? Your role in life? your role elsewhere. I don't know about you, sometimes these are very easily defined. In our immediate family, it's easy to know who's the father, who's the mom, who's the children. Those roles are easy. But I'm talking about roles that maybe are sometimes a little bit more confusing. Maybe about that large family gathering. Maybe uh, whose role is it to make the main dish? Whose role is it to help the side dishes get ready, and whose role is it simply to get out of the way and leave the cooks alone? Men, some of that may be us, but others of you may be good shells. Each of us has roles in every part of life, and we sometimes easily recognize them. Other times, we don't. I know in my family, for instance, it was one of my roles when we had large family gatherings to not only help Uh, prepare the food, but it was also to help calm the the one overseeing it, my grandmother. She would get overwhelmed because everyone didn't realize their role to stay out of the kitchen. They all wanted to, to linger in, and so as she would begin to panic, I had to say, it's okay, we'll get it. All right, you all go in there. That was my role. It was a hard role at times, but it was my role. But you know, of course, we're not here to talk about the roles of a family. We're here to talk about the role of the family, the family of God. Church member, have you ever considered what is my role in the local church? What are the duties I am being called to? Well, that's exactly what we're going to see this morning as we open up God's word from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. Uh, As with every passage of the Bible, we don't want to just drop in here randomly. This isn't some isolated text without a context. There's a context here to the whole of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, This is a letter written by uh, the Apostle Paul and Sylvanius and Timothy to the church of Thessalonica. It's written mostly to encourage the church and commend them in the work that they are doing. But there's some specific things that this church is being addressed with, namely... Don't forget those who have died are coming back. They will share in the inheritance that awaits you. They too will be raised in taste of the newness of life. Your suffering isn't in vain. Keep pressing on. The whole of of the letter is is mostly looking at the second coming of Christ and his return and, and things that deal with that. But as it does, there's some specific ways that the people need to wait. How they need to go about in the midst of waiting that second coming. How they're to interact with in the here and now while they wait for that which is to come. But yet, what is promised? And that's exactly what we see here in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 22. is a list of instructions, of final instructions. Now that you know the hope you have... Now that you know what's to come, now that you can rest in that, here's what you do in the meantime. Here's what you do while you wait on the hope promised in Christ. Now, just as a foresight has already mentioned, this text is not one I just randomly come to for our church this morning. This text was asked of me specifically to preach at an ordination service a number of weeks ago up at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And then this same passage is the text that Patoka's pastor, Reed Tallman, has asked me specifically to come and to preach to his church to help them too. So therefore, I come to that with that context in mind this morning. I don't come to it as, as saying, we need to hear this or it's here's what's been asked of me and it I want to share it with my own congregation as well may it be edifying may it be encouraging but that is the background we come to first Thessalonians 5 this morning so keep that in mind as we hear the word of the Lord from first Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 12 through 22 hear the word of the Lord we ask you brothers to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you 
and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. This is the word of the Lord. Now, if I've studied and wrestled with this text correctly, the main idea of 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 22 is this. If the church is to do the will of God, then we must labor for the good of one another as we seek to hold fast to what is good and abstain from all evil. Let me repeat that, and it's on the screen. If the church is to do the will of God, then we must labor for the good of one another as we seek to hold fast to what is good and abstain from all evil. We're going to look at this in four points that flow from this. Point number one, church members and their leaders. Point number two, church members and one another. Point number three, church members and prayer. Church, and point four, church members and the Spirit. Church members and their leaders, church members and one another, church members in prayer, and church members in the Spirit. So let's look at point number one, church members and their leaders. Look at verses 12 and 13 again. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. The brothers here is simply identifying those who are members of the body of Christ. This means brothers and sisters. Sisters, you are not left out of this. Adelphoi is, is predominantly male, but also compiles of mixed groups. This is to the whole of the church, the church body on this. We ask you, church body, to respect those who labor over you. Who are those that are to labor over well, we, we don't necessarily see that in, other than from their work here in 1 Thessalonians 5. But if we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture as we always should, then we do see more clarification on this role in 1 Peter 5, 1-6. through 6. So hear the word of the Lord from 1 Peter 5, 1-6. through 6. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Who is the church to subject itself under their rule to love and to respect and care for? The shepherds, the elders, the pastors, the overseers. These are not individual different roles. It's all one and the same used by these different terms. Pastor, shepherd, overseer, uh, elder. They're, they're all interchangeable. They are all referring to the off, one office that is described and laid out in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. This is the role in which the church body is to submit itself under. Now, being in a single pastor, solo pastor church, this can seem self-serving. But I want to note a couple different things. First and foremost, where my authority comes from to even preach on this. It's not from myself, but it's in the word of God. It is God's authority in which he is calling me to even address this from his word. 
So that's the authority. Second, Southern Baptists, we have a bad history of this, and so do a lot of American evangelical churches. The church was never, never intended to have a solo pastor, solo elder, solo shepherd. From the very beginning, it has always been intended and designed for it to be a plurality of elders, multiple men meeting the qualifications of elder as laid out in Scripture to do this work. We even see that here in 1 Thessalonians 5. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. This is in the plural. It's always expected that this is a plurality of it. So keep that in mind, too, as we, we look here. Because these men are being charged, elders, pastors, shepherds, they're charged with a specific task to be done together for the sake of the body. It's not for them in which they labor. So even this call should, should help soften this. It, it's not out of the self-serving that elders or pastors preach on something like this. But it's to see their role and yours. How do you sit under this? Well, what is the task that elders, shepherds, overseers are called to? I love how Jeremy Ryan in his book, Church Elders, puts it. He says, elders are pastors, shepherds. And their core job is to tend the church members like shepherds tend their sheep. To be more precise, elders are under shepherds who serve the good shepherd by leading his sheep. He goes on to add this. He says, the shepherd toils day after day in order to produce healthy, full-grown sheep that reproduce. Why are church members being called to love, to respect those that are among them, those that labor over them and admonish them? Because these very shepherds are charged with the task of caring and tending for them as sheep. What does a shepherd do? He labors to protect his sheep from wolves and danger. He labors to lead them to those still waters and those green pastures of nourishment, of provision. The shepherd's job is not simply to have the sheep willfully and forcefully submit to him. He's to guide them where they hear his voice so that they may taste the living waters, the bread of life in Jesus himself. It's the role of the shepherds to labor for the soul of his sheep so that they're built up and grown to maturity. This is the laboring in which they do. They do so by opening God's word and allowing the bread of life to be presented over and over and over again. Sometimes it's not easy truth that the shepherd has to do, but it's like a, being a shepherd is much like a parent trying to tell your kids, you can't just eat the candy and the ice cream. You need the vegetables and fruit to grow healthy. Yes, I know that sweet taste tastes good, but it's not good for you. It's not ultimately nourishing to you. You can't grow rightly. Friends, how many of you would go looking for the sweet taste of a one sermon that jumps your soul while neglecting the over and over faithful preaching of the word if you had your way. Do you see the job of the shepherd? It's, it's to over and over to point to the parts of the scripture that maybe make you feel uncomfortable. Maybe you don't necessarily like the way they taste at first. But it's the job of the shepherd to say, look, here's God's word. Here's what we live off of. Here's what he's telling us. And we want to eat of it so that we can live. Even when it's hard and we don't necessarily like its taste at first. But hopefully, over time, we'll grow to like that taste. Like your child has to learn to grow and like the taste of fruits and vegetables and other types of meat rather than just in the form of chicken nuggets. They have to acquire the taste. You see the role of the shepherd. This is my role as a pastor to labor, to shepherd in this way, to keep the wolves away, to keep false teaching away from us so that we may hear the true word of God and live by it alone. Warning against false teaching, warning against the dangers of what is out there that the world wants to incline us to. 
wanting us to stay away from ourselves and making the Christian life about us. Because it turns us inward instead of upward. You see the role of the shepherd. This is what they're charged to do. And this, it is for this reason that Paul and Sylvanius and Timothy write to the brothers here in Thessalonica. As you wait on the Lord to return, make sure you respect those who are laboring among you and are over you and admonish you. Make sure you respect them and esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Don't neglect it. Love them. Respect them because they are laboring for your very good. Is what Paul and Sylvanius and Timothy are teaching the church. One role as church members, and I say this again, not self-serving, but is to love and to respect those who are laboring for your ultimate good. Because I promise you, I don't spend the time I do and study just for my own edification. I don't get up here and do what I do just to hear myself talk. Go and ask my wife after the service. I'm my own worst critic. I beat myself up Sunday after Sunday. Man, I wish I would have said that clear. Man, I wish I would have made that point land a little better. It's not for me I do this. It's not that of any shepherd that they shepherd for the sake of themselves. If they do, they're ungodly. But it's for your souls. That's the heart of a true shepherd. And therefore, when you see that, love and respect and honor as God's word tells us to. Because I promise you, those men who labor in that way, nourish your soul and you will never forget them. But that's not the only way that we are called to care for one another's good. That's not the only way we're called to to live out the duty of a church member. Look at verses 14 as we move to point two. Uh, church members and one another. You see, it's the role of the shepherd to, to labor for the good of the sheep, but it's also the duty of the sheep to labor for one another. Look at verses 14 and 15 with me. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Pastors don't do this work alone. They're the primary ones who care for the sheep, but the sheep are also to labor for each other's good. They're to do good to one another. And here's how. First, there is the responsibility to admonish the idle there in verse 14. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. There there apparently in Corinth is, is an ongoing issue of people, especially those who are less fortunate, poorer, to depend upon others to live instead of going and doing work with their own hands. So Paul and Sylvanius and Timothy have already dealt with this in part. We see this, in fact, back in chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Turn your eyes back there with 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 through 12. It says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you were doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Church members are to admonish the idle among them, those that are simply looking for a handout and an easy help instead of doing the things that they are capable of on their own. That doesn't mean those that are weak. That doesn't mean those that are sick. That doesn't mean those who are unable. Those who are able should work hard with their own hands. In our work as Christians, we should be some of the most faithful workers. Because we should do what we're supposed to when no one is watching. We should show respect and honor to those who are in authority over us because we are Christians and we know what it's like to submit to an authority, to that of God himself. 
We know that our work is to be done as unto the Lord. So in our everyday means of work and life, we do all that we do to the glory of God. We're faithful in it. Christians should not be lazy and idle. And therefore, those that are being idle and lazy among us, we should admonish and say, Brother, sister, you are bringing shame to the name of Christ. Do work. Use the gifts that God has given you to care for yourself. Mind your own affairs. Stop being dependent upon others when you yourself have the means to care. So we admonish the idol. But second, we are to encourage the faint-hearted. Believe it or not, there are Christians who rightly hope in Jesus and yet feel faint. They feel weak. They feel down. They feel hopeless. And we as Christians are to encourage the faint-hearted. We're to encourage them not by just simply giving them words that we want them to hope in and think, Here's a little catchphrase. I'm going to use it and hope that this cheers them up. You know, hey, you got this. You've got this. It's all going to be better on the other side. You don't know if it's going to be better or not. That's not hope. That's not how you encourage the faint of heart. You encourage them by pointing them to God. Here is the truth of God. Here's what he's promised for you. He's not promised life is going to be easy, but he's promised that all things are working for your good and his ultimate glory. So even when we can't see it, we want them to be turned to him and see his glory, his trust, his track record. Say, brother or sister, in the midst of this weakness, I know it's hard. I can't even think or imagine what you're going through. But I know the God we hope in. Hope in him. Keep hoping. Here's the truth of what God has done. Here's how God has delivered people in similar situations throughout history. Will you trust in this God? Encourage the faint-hearted among you by pointing them back to the truths of God. This isn't just the pastor's job. It's the duty of every church member to do this. Brothers and sisters, how are we encouraging the faint of heart among us? But we also need to see that our call is to help the weak There at the end of verse 14, help the weak. Now, the weak often here in scripture when it it refers to weak is that of sickly, that of ill. Those are crippled and, and maligned, helping them and care for them in tangible ways. Maybe one way you help the the weak in, in a tangible way is provide a meal for them. But maybe some of us, especially not as gifted in in cooking, maybe men or or even some of you ladies, maybe the way you help the weak is going and doing a tangible chore that somebody needs help with that they can't do themselves. Stepping up and helping one another to do those means. Maybe it's running to the grocery store. Maybe it's a means of, of other ways of care. But help the weak among you. Care for them well. And some of you are already doing this well, so don't take this as a may of step it up or whatever. Some of you are doing this well and keep doing that. Help the weak. Fourth, we need to see that we are called to do all of this with patience. To be patient with one another. We're to be patient with the idol. We're to be patient with the weak. We're to be patient with those downtrodden in heart. We're not to go in forcefully and just say, get it done. We're to be patient, teaching, knowing it takes time for these things to come about. We want to be patient with them as Christ himself is patient with us. Think of how many times it's taken us as Christians to get a lesson through our thick skull. Think how many times the Lord has had to tell us over and over again. Don't be a grumbler. Don't be a complainer. Don't be a hot-headed. Don't get a temper. Don't be given to sexual immorality. Don't be given to greed. Don't be given to covetousness. And yet we still have to be over and over taught those lessons. Let us be patient then as the Lord himself is. Brothers and sisters, we're going to rub one another along the way. And we need to be patient as we help one another towards the end goal, which is maturity in Christ. We must be patient with one another. 
above all. Why? Because of what we see fifth here. It says there in verse 15, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Even in the body of Christ, there will be wrong done to each other. We will fail one another. Either individually or a group will fail another person or group within the local church. They're going to do them great harm. Maybe it's something even from the Sunday school lesson of begrudging them. And uh, my mind is going blank. So I will skip that connection. We, we don't want to be those people that criticize one another. We don't want to be those that just harp on one another. But we're going to. We're going to fail one another. We're going to let each other down. We're not going to meet those expectations. But when those things happen, Christian, we're not to return evil for evil. Just because somebody in this church harms you and rubs you the wrong way doesn't mean you go and return that an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. Just because somebody badmouths you, don't go and badmouth them. We're to labor for the good, not the harm of one another. We're to labor to build one another up in Christ. Because we're one body under one head of Jesus Christ. Therefore, church members, are you laboring for the harm of one another or for the good of the body? Are you laboring to build up the church body into Christ's likeness? By even the one who criticizes you publicly behind your back. Are you willing to pray for their soul? Are you willing to forgive them? Are you willing to be kind? Brothers and sisters, let us labor for the good of one another. Because this is the sixth way that we as church members are called to labor for the good of one another. To labor for each other's good. There at the end of verse 15. But always seek to do good to one another and to every one. Church member, it is your duty. It is your job. It is your role. To work for the good of one another. That means setting aside your preferences. Setting aside what you think is best. And working for the good of each other. Working together. Striving together. For the good of the whole. Not the part. You know. I, I know what weekend it is. It is a Memorial Day. I know we're. we're a lot of people are focusing on remembering those that have fallen for the freedoms we have. But one of the downsides of those freedoms in our nation is that we're an individualistic society. We're individualistic. As soon as we turn 18, you're out of your parents' house to do your own life. And part of that problem comes into the Christian life where we struggle here. We, we want to look out for what's mine... Not what's ours. That, that's the American culture there. It, and it's to our shame as Christians. We need to put aside that individualism and work to the good of the whole of one another. That See that we work for the good of our neighbor, for the good of our fellow church member. Because this is what it means to live the Christian life. Let us work for each other's good. Let's labor for the body of Christ so that we may build each other up by loving our neighbors. And notice there, it says to do good to one another, but also to everyone. So we need to do good here amongst the body of Christ, but we also need to do good to all. That means laboring for, for our communities that we live in, to labor for our nation, what's good and right, laboring in caring for those. But it also means laboring for the good in pointing them to Christ. We can't labor for the good if we ignore the souls that are perishing and headed to a Christless eternity. We can't do good that way. We're to do good for all. Let us labor then to care well, to help well, and not just Helping to say, oh, I, I gave some money here or I did this task. Well done. Let's labor to actually do good, to make good and lasting change. Brothers and sisters, let's be faithful in pursuing these. 
That is our duty as church members amongst one another. But we're also to, to be given to prayer. That's our third point this morning. Church members in prayer. Look at verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now at first glance it may seem this should say church members and rejoicing in prayer. But it's really one thing summed up in prayer. We're to rejoice always. How do we do that? By being a praying people. How do we rejoice in all circumstances? By being a praying people. By praying with thanksgiving to God. Remembering what he has done. Our God has been a God to rescue us from sin and death. Our God is the one who has given us promises that we have our hope secured in. Just listen as some of the ways here that God has encouraged the people here in Thessalonica. Paul, Paul writes, we, we always pray with thanksgiving to God because we have the hope that we have received the word of God. There in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he also talks about the hope of those who have been, they've invested in and seeing them walking continually in the faith in Christ. We see that they have hope in their suffering because it's not in vain. We see they have the hope of being joined to Christ their king in all eternity. This is the hope that they have. And therefore, Paul's like, you see this? You see this hope, this certain hope that I've promised you, that I've encouraged you in? This is why you rejoice always. This is why you rejoice always. Your current circumstances, I get it, they're hard. They're hard. But you can still rejoice. Because your present circumstances are nothing compared to what God has promised you. God has promised you uh, an eternal hope in Christ... In eternity, forever. And that's not changing. Rejoice in that. Hope in that. Yes, you're suffering. You're suffering for the name of Christ. Your circumstances are hard. Life is hard right now. You're fighting sicknesses, illnesses, disease, old age. You're fighting all of these. Rejoice in the hope you have. Not your present circumstances. Because otherwise, you don't truly know how to have a thankful heart because God has given us these things that are imperishable, not perishable. Too many of us are more concerned about only rejoicing when the perishable things come our way. Brothers and sisters, we have the imperishable promise to us in Christ. Eternity with Christ himself. He has bled and died so that we may live with him in all eternity in his resurrection. You see the reason we have to rejoice always. Let us be given to prayer then, constantly thanking God for what we have in Jesus Christ. Let us be a people that pray saying, God, I thank you that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You want more on that? Come back in a few weeks when we dive into Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. But see how we have been blessed, why we should rejoice and pray as Christians. But fourthly, we have a final thing we need to see this morning. We should be, as church members, given to prayer, but we should be church members who are filled and walking with the Spirit. Verses 19 through 22. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. We need to be a people who are Spirit-filled. What does it mean, though, to not quench the Spirit? Well, essentially to put out the Spirit, to extinguish the Spirit. Now, by no means is this saying that Paul thinks, or I think, that you can quench the Holy Spirit himself. You cannot quench the Holy Spirit himself of his work. But you can quench the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. How? Well, what does it say? Do not despise prophecies. But test everything. In the day this was written to the church at Thessalonica, prophecy still existed. The scripture, the canon of scripture, the canon of the Bible had not yet closed. The Thessalonians were, were wanting to, to guard against false teaching, but they were rejecting everything they were hearing 
in order to protect from it. Therefore, they were not only rejecting the bad, they were rejecting the good. So Paul and Sylvanius and Timothy are telling, look, don't reject prophecy. God is still speaking through his apostles to the church, equipping you on how to live in godliness, how to walk with Christ, how to live anew in him. So test everything. Don't just take it at face value. Test it. Make sure it is what is good. You accept that. You hold to that. What's bad? Throw out. What fails the test? Throw out and get rid of. But don't despise all prophecies because you know there's false teaching out there. Hold to what is true and good. Now, the canon of Scripture has long been closed. We know from Revelation that we are told that anyone who adds to these words or takes away from them should be accursed. The canon of Scripture is closed. Prophecy in the way it was that Paul and Sylvanius and Timothy are talking about here, it's done. We have the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. It's final. And in its original manuscripts, it is perfect. It is perfect. So what does that mean for us? Well, brothers and sisters, friends, it means that we need to come and sit under this authoritative word. We need to test teachers and making sure that they are actually teaching the word. So how do you quench the spirit? By coming unprepared and apathetic to receiving the word of God. We quench the spirit when our hearts come and just think, okay, I've got to be at church and duty without ever thinking, man, I'm going to hear the word of God. Sitting under it authoritatively. We sit here and quench the spirit when we fail to even follow along in the scriptures. What is being read and discussed. Making sure, is this from God or is this from man? Friends, one way you can help yourself in not quenching the spirit. Make sure you're opening your Bibles and following along. Don't just take my word. Follow the scripture over and over again. Look back to it over and over. Have read it ahead of time. Don't just show up thinking, oh, I can just show up and all of a sudden I'm going to be ready to hear from the Spirit. Take time on Saturday night or Sunday morning to read a, the passage of Scripture ahead of time and pray through it. Meditate on it. Come ready to receive God's Word. Because the Spirit and the Word, they work in tandem. We quench the spirit when we ignore and reject the word, when we don't take it in. Brothers, sisters, let us hold fast to God's word. Let us test it. Beware of false teachers because they are out there. Most of the ones you hear on TV, especially something called the Turner Broadcast Network, are full of false teachers. Not all, but most. They would rather you have the health and wealth and good news here in this life than what is promised to come. They do not teach the Bible. One of them even proclaims, this is the, the Bible and, and what it says I am, I am. Well, yeah, it says you're a sinner in the need of a Savior. It's one of the biggest heretics there are. Church, beware of false teachers. Just because they tag God onto it doesn't mean they are talking about the God of this Bible. Many talk about God and even will think highly of Jesus and yet don't preach the Jesus that the scriptures testify to. Many of the prominent false teachers, guess what? They would have hated Jesus in our day too because he would have condemned everything about them. Open God's word. Don't quench the spirit. Test everything. Make sure it lines up with the whole of the Bible. Not just a verse pulled out of context. Because I can promise you some of the most prominent pulled out of context verses that people like to talk about. Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Doesn't mean I'm going to be able to run and jump and touch the ceiling here. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What's going to happen if I try? I'm going to fall. But I can endure through hard circumstances because Christ strengthens me. I can rejoice always because Christ strengthens me. Because I have a hope that doesn't perish. Do you see the difference? 
or even that of, for I know the plans I have for you for good and prospering. Do you even know what the context, brothers and sisters, that surround that is? A lot of people want to use that. God is going to work this all out for your good in this particular situation. They don't know the future. When God said, I know all things that I, I know the plans I have for you for good. His people are about to go into exile. And he was working it for their ultimate good. We don't need to hold to false promises. We need to hold to the truth of the scripture in its context that points us to Christ and secures our hope on him. That's where our hope is. It's not found in me. It's not found in you. It's not found in anything else. It's found in Christ. So let us hold to teaching that points us to Jesus and our only secure hope in him. Brothers and sisters, let us be a people here at Central City Baptist Church that labor to not quench the spirit by holding fast to what is good. Let us be a people who are given to prayer, prayer of thanksgiving, so that we may rejoice always in reminding and remembering God's goodness. Let's be a people that labor to do good for one another, to build one another up and not harm. And let's be a people then that come and submit under the authority of God's word and the under shepherds he has placed over us as they labor for our good, rejoicing in them, being thankful for them so that we may be built up into maturity. You want to know how we do the will of God as Central City Baptist Church? It is by doing these things God has called us to. Stop worrying about everything else, the, the, the particulars, and let's start with what we know here from Scripture and being faithful in it. Let's go and do the will of God and glorify our God in all that we do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.